Well, ladies and gentlemen, our reading today is from Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 56. Uh, You can follow along uh, in in your Bibles at home or following along on the screen. Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 56. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud voice, You are the most blessed of women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leapt for joy inside me. She who has believed is blessed, because what was spoken to her by the Lord will be fulfilled. And Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour, because he's looked with favour on the humble condition of his slave. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, because the Mighty One has done great things for me, and his name is Holy. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. He's done a mighty deed with his arm. He's scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He's toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He's satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He's helped his servant Israel, mindful of his mercy, just as he spoke to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months. Then she returned to her home. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me lead us in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Luke, that Greek physician who carefully investigated all these eyewitness accounts and put them together in an orderly fashion from the very beginning so that Theophilus could be reassured about what he had learnt and believed about Jesus. Father, please reassure us of the truths of the good news of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, there's an outline there on the screen. Uh, You can take notes, you can follow along, you can send me questions uh, if any come up using the comments box at the bottom of the page. Uh, There's a show that my kids love called Mythbusters. A team of wacky science, special effects kind of people take on myths and they test them. Uh, The myths can range from ideas perpetuated by movies and TV shows through to sayings like a bull in a china shop. Uh, They test the myth and then offer an opinion, a definitive finding about whether this myth is plausible or whether it's been busted. At the heart of all their investigations, it seems to me, is one question. How is this possible? How is this possible? And they look at various permutations, options, scenarios. They test each one to come to their conclusions. Well, Mary has asked pretty much the same question. Luke chapter 1, verse 34. Mary asks the angel, How can this be since I've not had sexual relations with a man? Mary's been confronted by Gabriel who's told her that uh, she is going to bear a child who will fulfill all these promises God has made to save the universe. And Mary's scratching her head on a moral level, knowing God's law and the way small towns work. Mary has questions. She's engaged to Joseph, but they've not slept together. On a theological level, a Jewish lass like Mary would have questions. I mean, God taking on the form of humanity? Well, on a practical level, Mary would have had even more questions on the nature of a human bearing the Son of God, on pregnancy with no intimacy, on the whole reality of long-proclaimed promises shaking off their dust. How is this possible? Well, God's messenger, Gabriel, speaks immediately to a question. I'm at point two on the outline, verse 35, Luke 1. The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she's conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called childless. For nothing will be impossible 
with God. Gabriel points to the action of God. He'll bring about this pregnancy. In that sense, it's not going to break his law because he's consistent. It's not going to be immoral, not impossible. Gabriel then points to the evidence that we know has already taken place. He encourages Mary to go and visit her relative, to have a chat with Elizabeth. Remember her from last week? And Gabriel then sums up the action and the evidence in a statement of truth. Nothing is impossible with God. In essence, Gabriel has laid out an answer to Mary's question. But he's done more than that. He's actually issued an invitation for Mary to examine the facts and to come to the only conclusion possible. God can and will do what he's promised. Well, we love Mary's response, don't we? Verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. That's a grand statement of obedience. It's a grand statement of trust and submission to the plans and promises and fulfillment of God. But we can understand that perhaps Mary's mind and heart were racing and so in those days, verse 39, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. She doesn't muck about, does she? In haste, she sets off to see this impossibility that Gabriel invited her to consider. We understand that kind of inclination, don't we? We know this desire for certainty and evidence and examination. After all, that's why Luke has composed this orderly account of the life and deeds of Jesus so that Theophilus, its recipient, might be reassured of the certainty of the stuff he's been taught about and believed in when it comes to Jesus. It's no mistake then that within that account of certainty for Theophilus, we have this account of Mary's search for certainty. And the truth unfolds right in front of her, right in front of us as we read the account of her meeting Elizabeth. There's the physical evidence as Mary knocks on the door and as Elizabeth opens the door, the physical evidence is undeniable right there in front of her. Elizabeth is obviously six months pregnant. The woman who was barren is not anymore. There's the evidence in the flesh just as Gabriel stated. There's also the baby evidence. As Elizabeth hears the greeting of Mary, we're told the baby in her tummy kicks. Little Johnny is suddenly very active. We know this immediately as readers. Mary might have spotted this. Perhaps she's even got her hands on the belly of Elizabeth. Who knows? But Elizabeth states it openly in verse 44. Even the baby inside Elizabeth that baby who had the job of preparing God's people for the coming of God's promised king, even the baby recognises the moment. He's already doing his job preparing people. And for Mary, that adds to the accumulation of evidence standing right in front of her that only God could have brought this about. And then God speaks. There's more going on here than just an active baby and baby bumps. Luke tells us that that's actually a piece of evidence, a statement of his own strong investigation. Can you imagine the interview with Elizabeth that possibly took place? Luke tells us that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed. It's not just the statement of the physical, but also the explanation of the physical by the author of it all. Elizabeth's exclamation focuses on two ideas. First, Mary is blessed. She's been granted the approval of God. Let me say that again. She's been granted the approval of God. And we know this is not because of anything special about her. After all, she's a stock standard human teenage fiancé. It's all because of God. And we'll come to that in a moment. She's blessed because God has chosen her to bear the Lord of all the universe. Already we're seeing the order that was laid out there in the predictions we looked at last week. This son of Mary's will be blessed too. He'll be approved by God. On the basis of the reality that's coming, I don't think we know that Mary's pregnant yet, Elizabeth says a second thing. Mary is encouraged. She's exhorted to believe. Elizabeth states clearly to Mary, Take God at his word. Look at this. Take God at his word because he'll do exactly as he promised. I think at this point, Mary 
grasps the truth that Gabriel said would be revealed by this evidence in front of her. The evidence of the baby bump, the evidence of the baby jump, the evidence of God himself speaking, nothing is impossible with God. At this point, everything clicks into place. The light bulbs come on and Mary grasps the reality. Her questions are answered. How is this possible? It's possible by the action of God alone, by his intervention. The evidence speaks to that. Look at the baby bump. Watch the baby jump. Listen to God's words. This will take place, Mary. Mary's response, I'm at point four on the outline. Mary's response is a remarkable piece of reflection and praise. Uh, On one level, the maturity of the reflection that produces something like this is amazing. We must never underestimate Mary. She is often portrayed in the Gospels as a reflective and thoughtful young woman at this point. The depth of biblical reflection is astounding, even confronting. After all, this is a young woman who in one song reflects on the whole of God's historical action and distills it into a hymn of praise. And it's not random, it's not unhinged, it's not an ill-thought-through stream of conscience. This is a song of praise deeply rooted in the evidence and truth that Gabriel has spoken that she has just seen and experienced. The song itself is all about God. The descriptions, the actions, the commitment, the praise, they all focus on God and what he has done. Now, it, it would be a really worthwhile experience this week, each day in the next seven days, to sit down with this song, to read it, and just write down one new aspect about the character and action and promise of God that's emerged, and then pray about it. What a great job to do this week, every day. Mary herself has personally experienced the greatness of God. Just look there in verse 46 through to 49. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour because he's looked with favour on the humble condition of his slave. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed because the mighty one has done great things for me. His name is holy. What Mary has just experienced has confirmed for her the mercy of God to someone like her, a humble human being. That God would choose to do this through her is not so much a statement about her, but a statement of his generosity, his mercy, his salvation, his might. And Mary and what she has just experienced has come to know how unique God is, the holy character of God. There's none like him. There are many like her which then turns her praise outwards on a bigger scale. Look at verses 50 to 53. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. He's done a mighty deed with his army, scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He's toppled the mighty from their thrones, exalted the lowly. He's satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Mary's not unique in one sense. She's one of many to experience the mercy of God. Now God's mercy is akin to his grace. His undeserved kindness showered on those who do not deserve it nor have any reasonable expectation of such a gift from themselves and their nature. God has always acted like this. God is known for his mercy and grace. He is known as the one who takes the downtrodden and lifts them up. He's the one who's committed to a world that deserved judgment, that chose death over life, a world that is mired in sin, that has swapped blessing for brokenness. God committed to that world and to acting in it to restore it to his design and purpose. Mary's focus here, though, isn't just widespread, that God will do this for anyone, Well, we do know that God does those things. He has a general kindness. I mean, droughts break for everyone. But here Mary is talking about something much more specific. Did you see it there in verse 50? Mary is singing of the God who is committed to claiming a people for himself, bringing his own people back to dwell with him in his place under his blessing. God is working for those who throw themselves upon his mercy who have a right understanding of who they are before him. In fact, Mary knows that God's approval of her and all those who relate rightly to him is based not on human good deeds or merit, but on, well, look there in verse 54. 
He's helped his servant Israel, mindful of his mercy, just as he spoke to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. God's actions in Mary, uh, God's actions in Elizabeth are rooted back in what God promised to do through Abraham's mob. Remember that from Genesis 12, 1 to 3? God promised that through Abraham's family, he would roll back sin and restore the world, bring blessing. If virgin birth seems impossible, imagine the nature of the task of dealing with the nature of humans. Human nature that says, I'm God and God's not. Human nature that's mired in sin and yet God's committed to doing that. And so at the end of this song of praise, we can't avoid this truth. God is doing through Mary what he's always promised to do through Abraham's mob. God is promising. God is fulfilling his promise to roll back sin and to bring his blessing and restoration. At the end of a song like this, we can't avoid this truth. How good is God? He's to be praised because he's done exactly what he promised. He's worked through Abraham's family to bring about this moment, the moment when his son will come and deal with sin and bring restoration. How good is God? He's to be praised. How is this possible? I'm at point five on the outline. How is this possible? Well, Mary, go and visit Elizabeth. God has acted. God will act. Nothing is impossible for God. Elizabeth! There's a baby bump. There's a baby jump. There's a proclamation from Elizabeth via God. How good is God? His mercy. His mercy to those who depend on him. His mercy in me, a humble servant. His mercy as he promised he'll roll back sin and bring blessing. I've seen it with my own eyes. Well, just as Mary was reassured, so too Theophilus should have been. This has happened. This has taken place in real time and space. Moreover, so too are we, just like Theophilus. Here it is, this has happened. And so just as Mary was reassured, so too Theophilus, this has happened and so too are we. But out of that basic, tangible, historical reality comes a recognition of the nature and the work of God and he is good because he is great in his mercy and he is to be praised. On one level, Mary proclaims this because of what she's experienced and known and how she's looked at that, the lens through which she looks at the world, the lens of the promise of God to roll back sin and bring restoration through Abraham's mob. I wonder, well, it's certainly the question that's been posed for me. Is this how I view the world? Through that lens of the promise of God that will be fulfilled to roll back sin and bring blessing. Does that lens in me allow me to look at the world through a certain way? A lens that directs me to the mercy of God at work in real time and space for those depending upon him. Oh, on another level, what a song from Mary. What emotion. What praise. All coming out of those basic roots of the history of the evidence and the truth. Nothing is impossible for God. I suppose for me this week that really worked hard on me. When was the last time that I turned to God and praised him for the work that he'd done in the dirt of this broken world? I mean, I'm not going to experience what Mary's experienced. I'm bearing the Son of God. But I do experience the great mercy of God, the greatness of his action, the greatness of the God who blessed Mary in his mercy and has always done as he promised. When was the last time that I sang such a song of praise rooted in what God has done in history to the God who does as he promised. How great is God? How good is he? How good is God? He is so good and deserving of our praise and thanksgiving. And there is nothing more certain. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've given us here this little vignette of a woman looking for certainty who follows what she's been told to look for and sees the work of God and the evidence of God and the truth that comes from that. Father, this reassures Theophilus and it should reassure us. A Father, it gives us a lens through which to look at the world, through the promises that you will always fulfill. And Father, it gives us 
an example of a, a song of praise, an impromptu song of praise that merges out of uh, the, the, the meditation of your word. Father, please work in our lips those songs of praise as we live in this world, as we introduce others to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.